In this video, we're going to look in some more detail about how covalent bonds form. After watching this video and doing the relevant problems, you should be able to explain hybridization and to determine any specific hybridization from electron geometry. We've already discussed the idea of covalent bonds, which are formed by the sharing of electrons between two atoms. This sharing results in highly directional connections between the atoms and causes covalent compounds to have definite 3D structure. Now we're going to take this picture a step further by introducing a theoretical model known as valence bond theory. In valence bond theory, we think about chemical bonding as being due to the overlap of atomic orbitals. This picture arises from solving the Schrodinger equation for molecules. The molecular orbitals correspond to regions of high probability and occur where bonds are formed. Here's an example for the hydrogen molecule where we have two hydrogen atoms with unpaired electrons that come together to form a bond with a pair of electrons. Typically, the molecular orbital is more stable than the separated atomic orbitals due to this pairing of electrons. We can also look at the interaction of two hydrogen atoms as a function of the distance. So if we think about the atoms initially starting far apart where there's no interaction, as they come closer together, they're going to get more and more overlap until they reach the minimum possible energy. This optimal distance for the atoms where they have the best overlap and the least repulsion is what we refer to as the bond length. And the minimum energy is the bond energy. We can also think about interactions between different types of orbitals. In general, the chemical bond is just due to the overlap of orbitals. So as long as the orbitals are in the right orientation, they can interact. Most often, we're gonna be thinking about two unpaired electrons being brought together to form a bond which has the paired electrons. Here's the example for hydrogen fluoride where the 1s orbital on a hydrogen atom can interact with the 2p orbital on the fluorine atom to form a bond. Here's another example involving F2, where the interaction is now between 2p orbitals on the separate fluorine atoms. It turns out that most bonds are formed not directly from atomic orbitals, but using a mixture of what we learned for the atomic orbitals. This mixing allows the energy to be lowered and more accurately models the electron geometry that will be created. As an example, let's consider the carbon atom. The carbon atom has a filled 2s shell and two electrons in the 2p shell, as we saw from the Aufbau principle and, and the formation of the lowest energy electron configuration. Based on this and, and what we talked about at, for valence bond theory, we would predict that you form 90 degree bond angles and we have the ability to form two to three bonds between hydrogen atoms and carbon atoms. So two if we're pairing electrons, three if we're just considering one electron overlapping with an empty orbital. The, the 90 degree angle would come from the shape of the p orbitals. This is the prediction based on atomic orbital shapes. What happens in reality is that we act carbon actually forms four equal bonds. And so we can explain that by considering the 2s and the 2p orbitals mixing to form a new type of orbital, which is the sp3 orbital. And here we now have four new equal unpaired electrons, which can interact with four hydrogen atoms. Here's another picture of those four sp3 orbitals interacting with the hydrogen atoms. So hybridization is more general and there's many variations of hybrid orbitals that can be formed. The specific hybrid orbitals that are formed are those that create the lowest energy geometry. You should also be aware that the same atom can have different forms of hybridization depending on its bonds and what it's connected to. A popular example for this is the carbon atom, which can be sp, sp2, or sp3 hybridized. And generally, the orbitals will hybridize in order to give it the lowest energy. An important point to know is that the number of hybrid orbitals is always the same as the number of atomic orbitals that are mixed in. 
For the purposes of this class, the specific hybridization will be determined by the number of electron groups around an atom. We'll discuss more about this in the next module, but for now, just be aware that the electron groups will either be bonds or lone pairs. And any bond, whether that's a single bond, a double bond, or a triple bond, will count as a single group. Since electrons are negatively charged, they repel each other and will achieve the lowest possible energy when they're furthest apart. The reason that the electron groups are critical for determining hybridization is that the number of electron groups is typically equal to the number of hybrid orbitals that will be formed. Let's start with a look at the simplest hybrid orbitals, which are the sp orbitals, and they're formed by mixing an 1s orbital and 1p orbital. And when these come together, we combine them in a positive way and a negative way to give us two new sp orbitals. And they can be represented as shown in this image as two separate orbitals, or sometimes they're represented as a set of orbitals. Even though they have the same center here and it looks like it could be one, it's actually two separate orbitals here that could form two bonds with other atoms. You'll also notice here that there's two leftover p orbitals that are not hybridized. These leftover orbitals are generally either going to be empty or can be used in forming multiple bonds. So when we're thinking about the energy of the hybrid orbitals, we want to think about the fact that we're mixing these together and so the new energy is going to be somewhere in between. Although this, this ultimately results in a lower energy for the molecule, it does raise the energy of the atom, at least temporarily. So we form these two hybrid orbitals. Our unhybridized p orbitals do not change their energy. And we can see sort of how this might work in this example of beryllium hydride. So the beryllium has sp hybridization. It has one orbital pointing in each direction that can overlap with a hydrogen orbital. And so that forms our beryllium hydrogen bonds. The leftover p orbitals would still be on the beryllium atom and they would be sort of perpendicular to this bond. So we'll look at another example in just a minute where they're not empty, but for now in this example, they're just empty. So before we look at, at a case where the p orbitals are not empty, we need to think about the different types of bonds we can have. So far, all the bonding orbitals we've discussed have been along the bond, and these are known as sigma orbitals. The p orbitals, which are perpendicular to the bond, can also interact. And these orbitals overlap above and below the bonding axis. So basically the p orbitals can interact with their top lobe and their bottom lobe, and that forms what we call a pi bond. These different types of bonds are what how we can explain why we have molecules that actually form multiple bonds. Since only two electrons can be in each orbital, if we only had the hybrid orbitals, which were forming sigma bonds, we would only be able to have two electrons in between the atoms. But with the pi orbitals, we can also have additional pairs of electrons in between the atoms. And so we would count that as a double or triple bond. And one thing that you should note is that the sigma bonds are going to have better overlap because they're pointing right at each other. And so they form stronger bonds. And so it's generally easier to break pi bonds. And that has important consequences for chemistry, um, especially if you go into to organic chemistry, you'll see lots of examples of pi bonds as the reactive bonds. So let's look at one more example of sp bonding with the molecule C2H2. So again, each carbon atom here has two electron groups. Even though one of those groups is a triple bond, it still counts as one group. And so it's gonna have sp hybridization. And so those are represented by the, these purple lobes. That forms a sigma bond between the carbon atoms and also with the, the hydrogen atoms. And then the remaining p orbitals on the carbon atoms can overlap to form pi bonds. So only the unhybridized p orbitals are able to form pi bonds. The next hybridization ses that we're going to look at is the formation of sp2 hybrid orbitals. So now we're mixing one s orbital and two p orbitals together to form three hybrid orbitals. 
And those three orbitals are going to point basically at the corners of a triangle. That means we also have one leftover p orbital in this case that could go on and do things like pi bonds. So again, here's the energetic picture. So we're mixing these three orbitals together now. So we get three equal sp2 orbitals. And we have the one leftover p orbital that's not hybridized. So if we're thinking about bonding with sp2 orbitals, here's an example where we might see that. There's always a sigma bond between the, the atoms. And so if I'm looking at something like this molecule, which is formaldehyde, I have a carbon atom that's double bonded to an oxygen atom. And I also have two hydrogen atoms connected to this carbon. So we would say this carbon has three electron groups. It's gonna have three hybrid orbitals, which is the sp2 hybridization. And so we have overlap between the bond between the carbon sp2 bond and the oxygen in this case that form a sigma bond. And then the remaining p orbital on the carbon can interact with the corresponding p orbital on the oxygen to form a pi bond. One thing you might notice about pi bonds is that because they're sort of above and below, they actually lock the structure into place. And so if we think just about single bonds, they can rotate and we can twist the molecules around. It doesn't require actually breaking any interactions. If we consider a pi bond, we would actually have to break this double bond part of the molecule in order to rotate the molecule around. This leads us into the idea of structural isomers where you actually have two different molecules um, because you can't just rotate around a pot bond. This is another important consequence of bonding that will, that will come up if you take organic chemistry. We've already seen the case where you mix the s orbital with all three p orbitals, but just quickly we'll revisit it. So this is the formation of sp3 hybrid orbitals, where we mix one s orbital and three p orbital together to get four new hybrid orbitals. And the four hybrid orbitals are gonna be pointing at the corners of a tetrahedron, which is how they're able to get as far apart from each other as possible. So again, when we mix all four of these orbitals together, we get four new orbitals that are of equal energy. And so in sp3 bonding, we have no leftover p orbitals. And so we can only form sigma bonds and we form four equal sigma bonds at the corner of a tetrahedron. Now we can also look at hybridization beyond the sp hybrids. So when we get into the n equals three shell, we also have d electrons available that can participate in hybridization. So this is how we would understand interactions with more than four electron groups. So with five electron groups, we need an additional orbital and the next available one is going to be a d orbital. And so we end up with five sp3d hybrid orbitals. So there's three p, one s, and one d for a total of five here. And then we have some unhybridized d orbitals left over. And this lets us explain the geometry for five electron groups. So with five groups, in order to get as far apart from each other as possible, they're gonna form this structure called a trigonal bipyramid. Um, and this is only gonna happen when when you have n greater than or equal to three because you have to have those d electrons available. We can also use another d orbital to get six electron groups. And so this gives us another geometry with, with six groups. The way that they can get as far apart from each other as possible is to form an octahedron. We don't usually go beyond that. It just gets too crowded around the central atom. So to summarize, we know that bonds are formed by the pairing of electrons in atomic orbitals, and this forms what's called a molecular orbital. Or this happens because it makes a lower energy, and we have to use hybrid atomic orbitals in order to explain why we get equivalent bonds. Um, we also talked about two different types of bonds. We have sigma bonds, which are also the single bonds. Those form along the bonding axis. You can rotate around them and they're generally formed using hybrid orbitals. Our other types of bonds are pi bonds. And so those are used for double or triple bond forming. 
and they happen above and below the bonding axis. And basically they aren't able to rotate easily. And all of this presumes that the electrons are localized in the molecule. So in the next video, we'll talk about a different model of bonding where electrons are not required to be localized in atomic orbitals, but for now they are, and this is one way of explaining bonding. So here's all, here's again, just a quick summary of the hybridization schemes we looked at. Basically, depending on the number of electron groups you have, that's how many hybrid orbitals you're going to need. Um, and so if we have two groups, we need to mix two orbitals to get two hybrid orbitals. And so that would be the sp. Here's the sp2 and sp3 shapes. And then we can also get up to five and six groups by incorporating d orbitals. So that's all for now, and I hope to see you again shortly as we discuss more about bonding.